If you saw this patient who accidentally swallowed a screw after having a fall, would you have sent them home from the emergency department? This is a post that came up on one of the Facebook physician pages. Family medicine here. One of my patients contacted my office stating she had a long screw held in her lips and fell backwards, believing that she had swallowed it. No symptoms otherwise when she called. Based upon the history, we sent her to the ER where this x-ray was taken. Shortly thereafter, she was discharged by the ER physician assistant who saw her with the instructions to follow back up to my office in a week or return to the ER if she starts bleeding. Am I missing something as to the standard of care she was given? Thanks in advance. And here you can see this long, somewhat sharp object uh, that is clearly in the GI tract potentially in the stomach, but uh, not 100% sure. And the question is, do you agree with the management of this patient? And you can see that this sparked off a whole slew of kind of discordant opinions on whether this was managed correctly or not. So the author wrote a couple of follow-up details. So working on getting more details as to how the hell she was discharged without a call to me, or more importantly, a consult to GI or surgery. Currently waiting on a GI colleague to call me back to see if he can evaluate her urgently. Funny, I thought this was supposed to happen in the ER. This person says, first time in history someone fell and a foreign object went in from the top. Uh, because obviously I think uh, in the ED they see a lot of patients with things from the bottom and the story is that they fell. Uh, so that's definitely a very interesting one. But you can see a lot of people said, call the ER and speak to the MD. This guy says, GI, this is one thing that would get me out of bed at night. I was always taught to treat your patients as if they were family, meaning the same level of care. I would not want my child, mother, father, sister, or brother to wait for a perforation. Write this PA up. This guy says he is GI. Um, he says he would have come in to fish it out if the ER called him. Uh, full disclosure, I am a radiologist, but what? Send her back to the ED or maybe to a better ED. This person says, this can't be real. Is this a prank? I am sorry, but this story is unbelievable. This person's actually a psychiatrist, and they said they have cared for many patients with ingestions of more objects than you could possibly imagine. Obviously, this should have been scoped. If I could get a contact for the PA, I'd probably call to have a what the what discussion and then talk to whoever the supervising physician is to let them know I'm worried about that level of oversight. All that said, there is no earthly way one could have a nail that long in their lips, swallow it, and then not be 100% sure what happened. There's absolutely more to this story, and I kind of want to know what really happened. And so obviously the psychiatrists see these kind of foreign body ingestions all the time. And so there were a couple of psychiatrists who had commented in this thread, uh, kind of asking about the true the truth of the story, uh, you know, feeling that it wasn't really the entire full picture. Yeah, here's the other one. Adult psych. Not helpful with your question, but does this patient have a history of swallowing foreign objects? The story she gave you seems a bit obscure. This person says, nothing wrong with that story. Lots of people put screws in their lips. For example, they're using their hands to fasten one screw and they have a few more to do next. That seems a little bit of a dangerous thing. I could definitely see people putting it in their mouth, but it does seem a little dangerous to put it in your mouth. <laughs> this person actually has a stock photo of somebody with a screw in their lips. It's almost a no-brainer. A third-year medical student on their first day of their very first rotation could tell us that. I just don't understand sending this person home instead of the ER. God help this country for so many reasons. But then you have the other side of the story as well. And so I will um, show you a lot of the perspective of other GI doctors and the ED. And uh, interestingly, this is actually a board exam question that I got as a third year medical student. And so it's interesting to see that there's so much varying opinions on this particular case. And I think this case is uh, kind of, it, it, there's a reason that there's some varying opinions on this. But this person says, it's clear that physicians in this group don't understand what happens in the ED. You'd be amazed at what we're told to send home over the phone. So when we call and ask you to see a patient, just remember this thread. And here's another one. Okay, you guys are losing your minds over this. I'm emergency medicine, and while I would have called GI about this because of its length and sharp tip, I could absolutely see them telling me to discharge this patient from the ED. I can think of a lot worse things a PA could do. Who knows, maybe they did run it by GI. And this person says, as always, we agree. I'd call because it's probably over three centimeters and sharp, but the likelihood of GI telling me to send this home is much higher than them coming in to fish it out. This person says, yeah, I'd call, but I've had surprising foreign bodies that GI has said let pass. And sure enough, it does. I can see calling because it's still in the stomach and so still possible to retrieve, but just because something is sharp doesn't mean you have to go after it. 
Emergency medicine here. I'd call GI for this, but they would probably tell me to see if it will pass on its own. And this guy responded, surgery here. Not okay to watch one that long. This is at risk at the pylorus, at the duodenal C loop, and at the ileocecal valve. A smaller object I'd watch, but this was within EGD reach at the time of the film. Thankfully, it passed the esophagus, which is the greatest morbidity and mortality if perforation. I would call the patient back in, yes now, and repeat film. It may still be pre-pyloric. I don't necessarily disagree, but I've been in this rodeo a few times over the years. And then the surgeon replied, me too, 35 years. Razor blades to forks to condoms full of cocaine to toothpicks and shellfish that kill. The foreign bodies don't all follow the rules. If this was already in the small bowel or was smaller, I'd be the first to observe. But if it's in the easy reach of a minimally invasive EGD, Get it. GI, pointing thing in the stomach, 10 out of 10 would remove. This person says GI here. This is tricky. It's not really sharp, but it's long. If it's under 5 centimeters, it's probably okay, but it's a little sharp, so some risk. If just swallowed and does not have a full stomach of food, I might go after it, but may pass from the stomach quickly by the time you can get to it. Then you just have to wait and see if it makes it through the ileocecal valve. You have to weigh the risk of the scope itself and the retrieval, which includes pulling something sharp through the esophagus. We often go looking for things, but often they have already passed the stomach, an accessible portion of small bowel, and unless really big in my experience, they pass eventually. All right, and this is the last one I'm going to read, but nine times out of 10, if I call GI for this from the ED, they tell me to discharge the patient and see if it passes. Just keeping it real for all of you that want to throw EM under the bus. So what is actually the best answer in this case? I'm going to go over a question with you guys that I had received as a third year medical student. You can see it's in my Anki deck here. And it's asking, what is the best next step in a patient who ingested a fish bone, but nothing is visualized on the x-ray? And the answer is to undergo an endoscopic evaluation. Because just because you have a negative x-ray, um, there can be false negatives, and it's still a sharp object that could potentially cause perforation. So endoscopic evaluation would be indicated in that case. Other objects that should be endoscopically removed include batteries because of chemical exposure. It can cause like this liquefactive necrosis of the esophagus and magnets because they can kind of suck onto each other and cause bowel entrapment, obstruction, or necrosis just from the pressure of magnets sticking to together. However, if a sharp object is visualized in the duodenum, uh, past the point of the very proximal duodenum where they can still reach with the EGD, no treatment is indicated and it will probably pass on its own. So if the sharp object is, is there, obviously we want to remove it if we can, but a lot of times it's already past the point of us being able to endoscopically remove it. And the management at that point is really just observation. And so that's why GI is going to frequently request just kind of serial monitoring. So here you can see foreign bodies of the esophagus and gastrointestinal tract in children. And you can see that urgent removal is required for multiple high powered magnets, sharp or long objects greater than five centimeters, a disc battery, uh, an object in the esophagus for greater than 24 hours, or anything with airway compromise, esophageal obstruction, or intestinal obstruction. However, for expectant management, intervention can often be delayed for up to 24 hours. Many of these objects will pass spontaneously into the stomach and beyond. And objects that have passed beyond the proximal duodenum are not accessible to the endoscope, and most will pass without complications. The progress of radio-opaque objects down the GI tract should be monitored with serial radiographs. You can also see on the article for ingested foreign bodies and food impaction in adults, it really is kind of the same thing. So some of the objects based on their size of greater than five centimeters, their sharpness, if they have magnets, uh, those are objects that they may want to endoscopically remove. But again, in general, conservative management is appropriate for the majority of foreign body ingestions, since most objects will pass uneventfully. So yeah, going back to this case, I think you really could make a reasonable argument that this could be managed conservatively. Um, although the one thing that kind of makes you lean more towards doing a procedural intervention is the fact that it may still be in the stomach. You know, if it's kind of in this upper left area right here, that kind of suggests that it's probably in the stomach still. And so potentially this could have been removed endoscopically. But based on all of this kind of heated discussion in the comments and everything, really it could have gone either way. And I, I don't think it was necessarily wrong that the patient was discharged. I do think it's interesting that people said this was like a clear cut uh, black and white case where it should have been removed right away. Uh, and that even a third year medical student would know the answer to that. But if you actually go to the board questions, this is actually a very commonly tested board question. And a lot of these foreign body ingestions are just managed conservatively, especially if they've progressed a little bit too far.
So here was an update 22 hours after the initial ingestion. You can see that the object now has progressed and is making its way through the GI tract. And so the update, as previously noted, the patient was discharged from the emergency room. I called and spoke to the PA who saw her and was told that no consults, GI or surgery were requested. And the patient was not seen or discussed with the attending ER physician. After my phone call stating my concerns, as previously mentioned, the PA contacted a GI on call and discussed the already discharged patient with him. The advice given by the GI was that foreign bodies like this often pass on their own and agreed with the discharge. The PA then, likely in reference to my concern about how the case was handled, called the patient and told her that he had checked it out with a GI doctor and if she had any bleeding or other symptoms to return to the ER. No serial x-ray follow-up was arranged. Fortunately, the patient was asymptomatic overnight and I had her arranged to have serial abdominal x-rays and I had already made one of my local GI colleagues aware and on call in case intervention was necessary. Very interesting to hear all of the differing and quite heated opinions associated with this case. I present it only for education purposes and certainly not to criticize any particular physician subtype or even ancillary providers. So overall, I thought this was a very interesting case to go over with you guys. I did wanna share one more thing with you guys that I learned a few months ago. And uh, this is in regards to a gastric bezoar. So let's say somebody swallowed a bunch of hair or some kind of material that's kind of blocking up the uh, gastric outlet. That's what we call a bezoar. And one of the treatments that I learned for it uh, is actually very interesting. So uh, GI actually uses Coca-Cola to dissolve gastric bezoars. So in patients with mild symptoms due to gastric phytobezoars, we suggest initial treatment with chemical dissolution rather than initial endoscopic therapy. We administer Coca-Cola for chemical dissolution. So uh, I just thought it's very interesting because I saw this recommended on one of the patients recently that they were supposed to be drinking like Diet Coke, BID or, or something. I don't remember the exact timing. But very interesting that Coca-Cola is the preferred pharmacologic treatment for a gastric bezoar. It kind of makes you wonder how toxic and acidic is Coca-Cola and sodas in general if they are strong enough to be dissolving gastric bezoars. Uh, is this really something that we should be putting in our body? <laughs> so very interesting that, you know, they've got a lot of interesting treatments from the GI perspective side of things. The other one that I was teaching uh, my residents about recently is that for prevention of post ERC pancreatitis, one of the treatments they give is rectal endomethacin. So GI has a lot of fancy and interesting treatments up their sleeve. And definitely, you know, they know what they're doing. Even if they say to discharge that patient, there's got to be a strong reasoning behind it. So anyways, I hope this was an interesting case for you guys to take a look at. Curious to hear what you guys would have thought about the management of this case. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. And until then, good luck and have fun.